Few machines capture the imagination quite like the Saturn V rocket. I mean, this colossal creation didn't just reach for the moon. It delivered humanity there. Yeah. It really did. Exactly. And uh, right at the heart of it all was Werner von Braun, a figure whose story, well, it's as complex as the rockets he designed. That's absolutely right. So in this deep dive, we're going to explore von Braun's journey, really, tracing his... Uh, his early fascination with spaceflight, right. his key role in developing rocket technology, and of course, his leadership in creating the Saturn V. It's a story where, you know, scientific genius meets a morally complicated past. A tension we definitely need to understand. So we'll start with those formative years, what first sparked that passion for rocketry. Mm -hmm. Then we'll navigate his um, his early work in Germany and that big shift when his work became tied to the German military. A crucial period. Then after that, his move to the U.S. working at Redstone Arsenal. And then, of course, the main event, the Saturn V. The big one. The sheer power, the innovation, the engineering audacity and its role in Apollo. We've used NASA records, technical docs, Smithsonian articles, biographies, a whole range. And our aim here is really to give you a, well, a rounded picture of Von Braun. The visionary engineer, yes, but also acknowledging the, uh, the difficult historical context. Understanding the man and the machine he helped create. Precisely. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Childhood. Von Braun was apparently just completely captivated by space travel ideas. Deeply drawn to it, yeah. It wasn't just a passing phase for him. It was a real driving force early on. And he didn't just read about it, did he? He got involved. No, he was active. He sought out knowledge, uh, joined those early German rocket societies. These were groups of, well, enthusiasts and pioneers doing the very first basic experiments. Ground floor stuff. Absolutely, ground floor. And inevitably, perhaps, these experiments started getting attention. Military attention. They did. That was a real turning point. The military saw the potential, obviously, for long-range weapons. Right. And that led to von Braun's involvement with them shifting his focus, really, from space dreams towards military rocket applications. Which brings us directly to the V-2 rocket. Can you talk a bit about the V-2 itself, technically, and von Braun's role? Sure. The V-2, for its time, was a major leap. It used liquid propellants, fuel, and oxidizers stored separately. Which gave it more control, more range. Exactly. Better control, longer range compared to the simpler solid fuel rockets back then. Von Braun was the key figure, the technical director leading the team that designed and built it. They overcame some pretty significant engineering hurdles. But there's a very dark side to the V-2 story, isn't there? The production involved forced labor on a horrific scale. Yes, that's absolutely crucial context. The V-2s were built in horrific conditions using slave labor, primarily from concentration camps. Thousands upon thousands died building these rockets. More people died building them than were killed by them as weapons, I understand. That's tragically true. It was an incredibly brutal program. And ironically, as a weapon, the V-2 was actually quite inefficient for the resources poured into it. There are differing accounts about von Braun's feelings during this time. Some suggest regret over the military use. Others point out the horrific labor conditions should have been the primary focus of any regret. It's, uh, it's a deeply debated aspect of his life. The record is complex, and people interpret his actions and statements very differently. But the reality of the forced labor is undeniable and cannot be minimized. Okay, so after the war ends, his path takes another sharp turn. Operation Paperclip, the move to the United States. Right. Both the U.S. and the Soviets were eager to get their hands on German rocket know-how. Von Braun and a large group of his engineers were recruited by the Americans and brought over. And he ends up at Redstone Arsenal in Alabama. Yes, in Huntsville. He started working for the U.S. Army there, applying his expertise to American rocket programs. So at Redstone, he's contributing to early U.S. rockets, kind of laying the groundwork for what would eventually become NASA's efforts. Exactly. This period at Redstone was vital. He and his team were instrumental in developing rockets like the Redstone, which actually launched America's first satellite, Explorer 1, and the first American astronaut, Alan Shepard. It was a transition back towards space exploration goals. And then comes the big moment. President Kennedy's challenge in 61, land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth before the decade is out. A monumental goal. And that goal demanded a rocket far beyond anything existing. Enter the Saturn V. The leap from Mercury to Apollo, it's just staggering to think about. Oh, completely different orders of magnitude. Mercury was tiny capsules in Earth orbit. Apollo needed huge spacecraft, lunar modules, life support for long durations, all needing to get to the moon. 
So the launch vehicle had to be enormous. Enormous. The Saturn V was an entirely different class of machine. Yeah. Nothing like it had ever been attempted. And the nerve center for building this beast was Marshall Space Flight Center, also in Huntsville, where Von Braun was now director. That's right. Huntsville and Marshall became synonymous with the Saturn V. Von Braun's leadership there was central to the whole project's design, development, testing. Everything. The engineering challenges must have been just unbelievable. It wasn't simply scaling up. It required fundamental breakthroughs, didn't it? And even building giant new facilities. Precisely. You couldn't yeah. just make a redstone rocket bigger. The physics change. The materials requirements change. Everything changes. They were pushing the absolute limits in metallurgy, in combustion science, cryogenics, guidance, control. And construction. Yeah. The vehicle assembly building, the VAB, just to house the thing. Exactly. You needed entirely new infrastructure structure just to handle a rocket that size. It was a systems engineering challenge on an unprecedented scale. Let's zoom in on those first stage engines, the F1s, five of them. Developing those alone sounds like a saga. It really was. The F1 engine was uh, a beast. Getting something that powerful to burn fuel smoothly was incredibly difficult. The main problem was combustion instability in that huge chamber. Meaning it would shake itself apart. Essentially, yes. Early tests were often catastrophic. Engines would literally explode on the test stand, destroying everything. They had to figure out how to introduce the fuel and oxidizer in just the right way, using baffles inside the injector plate to damp down those oscillations. Scaling up isn't simple. And failure wasn't an option with astronauts sitting on top. Reliability had to be absolute. Paramount. Crew safety drove everything. They tested and retested relentlessly until they were confident the F-1s would work. They actually ended up running them at about 90% of their theoretical maximum thrust just to add that extra margin of safety. The Saturn V had that iconic three-stage design. Can you walk us through what each stage did? Sure. So the first stage, the SIC, had those five massive F-1 engines. Its job was pure brute force, lifting the entire stack off the ground and getting it through the thickest part of the atmosphere. Then it drops away. Right. Then the second stage, the SIA, took over. It had five smaller, but still very powerful, J-2 engines burning liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. This pushed the vehicle to near-orbital altitude and velocity. And the third stage? The SIVB. It had a single J-2 engine. It fired briefly to put the stack into a parking orbit around Earth. Then, after systems checks, it fired again the crucial translunar injection burn to send the Apollo spacecraft hurtling towards the moon. How did the stages separate? Was it just explosive bolts? It was more sophisticated than just that. Between the SIC and S2, they used what's called a delayed dual-plane separation. Small retro rockets fired on the spent SIC to push it away cleanly. <laughs> Between the SIC and SIVB, it was a simpler single-plane separation. Pre precision timing was critical. And keeping everything connected electrically and fueled on the pad and then disconnecting cleanly at liftoff, the umbilicals must have been complex. Very complex. These lard arms swung away at the last second, carrying power, data, pneumatics, and importantly, the propellant lines for loading those super cold liquids. Redundancy was built in everywhere. And during flight, there's constant communication needed between the stages and the spacecraft, right? Managed by the instrument unit. Yes. The instrument unit, the IU, which rode atop the SIVB stage, was basically the rocket's brain. It housed the guidance computer, the control systems, telemetry. It was the central nervous system, processing data and sending commands to steer the rocket, manage engine burns, stage separation, everything. Structurally, keeping something that tall and heavy, full of sloshing propellant from bending or breaking during ascent, that and sounds a, tricky. A huge consideration. Balancing strength with weight is always key in rocketry. The structure had to be incredibly strong, but also as light as possible. And yes, propellant sloshed the fuel moving inside the tanks could destabilize the rocket. They needed sophisticated baffling inside the tanks and precise flight control adjustments to counteract it. Managing the propellants themselves, loading super cold liquids, venting gases, making sure the fuel was settled in the tanks for engine restarts in zero G. All complex procedures. Loading took hours. Venting was constant to manage pressure. And for the SIVB restart in orbit, they used small ullage rockets, tiny thrusters that fired briefly just before reignition. To push the propellant. Exactly. To push the liquid hydrogen and oxygen back down towards the engine intakes, ensuring a clean start in weightlessness. The SIVB also used a clever propulsive vent of excess hydrogen gas after its main burn to fine-tune the trajectory towards the moon slightly. And the flight control system tied all this together. Yes. The IU computer processed navigation data and controlled the vehicle's attitude, its orientation, primarily by gimbling the engines, tilting them slightly. 
It also used smaller auxiliary thrusters for finer control, using input from rate gyros to measure rotation. And monitoring all these systems required tons of sensors. Thousands of sensors measuring temperatures, pressures, flow rates, vibrations, everything imaginable. All that data was streamed back to mission control via the telemetry system, giving engineers real-time insight into the rocket's health. The manufacturing scale was also unique, places like Michaud in Louisiana, and getting these huge stages to Florida that needed special transport, like the Super Guppy plane. That's right. Michaud built the SIC first stage and the HIVB third stage. Boeing built the SIC second stage near Los Angeles. Moving these massive structures required custom barges and, yes, the bizarre-looking Super Guppy aircraft, a heavily modified cargo plane, was essential for flying the SIVD stage around. It's easy to get lost in the tech, but the human element. The engineers working crazy hours. The dedication was incredible. People worked literally around the clock, especially during testing and launch campaigns. It took a huge toll on personal lives. But alongside the grand goal, it was also day-to-day -day engineering, solving problems, endless meetings, documentation. The mundane behind the magnificent. In a way, yes. Extraordinary results built on tireless, often unglamorous effort. And then the launch itself. Highly automated countdowns, right? Very automated. Especially the final minutes controlled by a terminal sequencer. Lots of safety interlocks. It all relied on massive ground support equipment, the VAB for assembly, the crawler transporter to get to the pad, the launch control center, a huge infrastructure. Just to put the power in perspective, that s pate stage alone was over a million pounds of thrust. The propellant loads were immense. It's still hard to fathom it actually worked so reliably. Which brings us neatly to its ultimate purpose, being the launch vehicle for Apollo. It was the key that unlocked the moon missions. Apollo 8 was the first time humans flew on it, right? Circled the moon at Christmas 68. What an experience that must have been. Absolutely groundbreaking. Bill Anders, one of the astronauts, famously described the liftoff feeling like an old freight train on a bad track, just raw, immense power. And then July 1969, the lunar landing, Apollo 11. None of it happens without a Saturn V performing flawlessly. Impossible. Its power, and crucially, its proven reliability by that point, made the lunar landing achievable within Kennedy's time frame. It was the indispensable heavy lifter. After Apollo, Von Braun didn't just stop, did he? He continued working in space exploration. That's right. He moved into NASA management for a time, advocating for future missions, like the space shuttle and missions to Mars, though he left NASA before those became reality. So wrapping this up, we've traced Von Braun's journey. From that early fascination, through the complexities of the V-2... The critical work at Redstone. ...to becoming the chief architect of the Saturn V. We've touched on the rocket's incredible engineering, the challenges, the power, and its undeniable role in getting humans to the moon. But we also have to circle back to the V-2 and the ethical shadows cast by his work during that period. The forced labor issue remains central to his legacy. It absolutely does. It's a legacy that's still debated. How do you balance the scientific brilliance and the monumental achievement of Apollo against his wartime activities? Which really leads us to a final thought for you, the listener, to consider. How should we weigh these things? How do we reconcile groundbreaking achievements with the morally problematic actions or associations of the individuals behind them? What does Von Braun's story and the story of the Saturn V tell us about progress, history, and the complexities we have to grapple with when looking back? It's not always simple, is it? There are rarely easy answers when you dig deep into history. Definitely not. We really encourage you to look into the sources we mention, NASA's archives, the various accounts of his life, and the Apollo program. There's always more to uncover. Always more layers to peel back in these deep dives. 